The gospel message can be summarized very simply. If we look in the book of Acts and we get away from all this Pentecostal nonsense that's so prevalent in our society, it's a departure from iniquity. Repentance and faith proven by deeds. Repentance towards God and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. And that repentance proven by the deeds that you perform. In Acts 3.26, it says this, he says, To you first, having raised up his servant Jesus Christ, and sent him to bless you in turning away everyone from his iniquities. From his iniquities. That's the close of one of his sermons. To, Jesus came to save his people from their sin, to deliver them from their sin. Not to save them in their sin. Not to say everybody's saved in sin, as all the preachers say today. He came to deliver them from sin. Matthew one twenty one, Luke one seventy five, to serve him in righteousness and holiness all the days of our lives. That's the message of the gospel, the very simple message. Repentance like repentance and faith, the present day church system, professing church system has this whole process in reverse. Instead of departing from iniquity, like 2 Timothy 2.19 says, the solid foundation remaineth, but those that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Instead of that, we got professing Christians are workers of iniquity. Like it says in Matthew 7, where they come before Christ and claim to have done mighty deeds in his name, and he says, depart from me, of course, he says, I never knew you. And he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You see what I'm saying here? That's the reason, back to Acts 3.26. Departing from iniquity. to Turning every one of you away from his iniquities. And that's what we see in the prophets. To turn people away, to amend their ways, to prepare their hearts, to stop the evil and wickedness of their hands in their lives. Come, let us reason together, learn, you know, seek to do good. All those kind of things that the, the prophets would have us say. So workers of iniquity is exactly the judgment that's going to come down on this present day professed church. People today in the system are taught to excuse their sins because it's inbred from birth. And then as a result, they argue in favor of sin from the scriptures. The preachers do that all the time. You're the chief of sinners. You're the Romans wretch. And they argue in favor of sin all the time. It's the perfect deception. But it's all based on the, the fictional myth that you're born in sin. And there's nothing you can do about it. So the common myths of present-day Christianity that keeps everybody a worker of iniquity while they think they're in, saved, the common myths are you're born in sin. You're born inbred sin, inherited from Adam, the guilt. It'd be various ways in various church denominations. You're saved in sin. Now, this is universal. You're universal. Ask any pastor, any church, whether you've got to stop sinning to come to, to be receive Christ, to be filled with the Spirit. And they've got totally in reverse, totally in reverse. They've got you have to repent and then... Get saved and then repent. So they have it in reverse. And of course, no one can ever stop sinning before or after they're saved. It makes no difference. They have no ability, therefore, because of their uh, lack of free will or because they're affected, they're born under a, a corrupted, uh, corrupted nature. So no one can stop sinning before they get saved. And then, of course, God's going to deliver you from your sins, as I've pointed out in many other videos. He's going to deliver you from your sins, but it never seems to happen because everybody sins every day in thought, word, and deed. Because everybody's a Roman's wretch and everybody's the chief of sinners. Everybody's heart is wicked. Everybody's deceitfully wicked. But see, that's not what that verse means in Jeremiah 17. You're forgiven in advance. Past, present, and future sins are forgiven. Again, this is, this is universally taught across the board. You tell people that their future sins are already forgiven in Christ. In fact, John Piper loves to tell people the sins you're going to commit next week. Already forgiven. You know, what kind of an attitude could you have towards purity and holiness and obedience to Christ? 
if you truly believe that kind of nonsense. None whatsoever. So it all boils down to nobody's perfect, it's not of works, and nobody can judge, as I've said a hundred times before. A hundred times before. Nobody's perfect. And of course, anybody that says anything about stopping sin, oh, you're preaching, you're preaching sinless perfection. Nobody can be as perfect as God. Well, you're not asked to be perfect as God. You're asked to love Him with all your heart, your mind, your strength. That's what you're asked to do within your ability. Do you, do you even do that? No, you don't do that because you're a worker of iniquity. See, all this that they teach workers of iniquity, saved in sin, born in sin, they may or may not base it on Scripture, but it's assumed as true by nearly everybody in the system. The scholars and the theologians that write the books and the commentaries and uh, all the study guides, they'll convincingly support these notions as they trickle down into your various church denominations and creeds. And that's where you learn them. You may not be as versed as they are, as convincingly argue these things as they can, but they trickle down into your creeds and doctrines. So that creates such terms then. So you have to create a whole different vocabulary to support these false doctrines, this fiction, these fallacies. They create such words as vicarious, expeditory, substitution, moral transfer, original sin, eternal security, and faith alone. None of those things can be found anywhere in the Bible. None. You're not going to find those words anywhere, the word vicarious or expeditory or substitution in the Bible. In fact, Jesus never presented himself as a, a substitutionary sacrifice, just as a sin offering. But yet they remain the fundamental foundational theology behind the doctrines that these professing Christians believe in as the true source of their salvation and their, their trip into the kingdom and their faith in eternal well-being. Basically, most professed Christians, they can tell you from gleaning this stuff in over the years and setting in their Bible studies and Sunday school classes, they can tell you that Jesus died in their place on the cross for their sins. It's never to deliver them from their sins. It's always, Jesus died for my sins. Jesus suffered God's wrath in, in my place and became sin for me. They may or may not know that, but a lot of people will, will hide behind that fallacy. God transfers then Jesus' obedience and righteousness. They make this pretty clear, most of the modern day preachers. Transfers obedience and righteousness by faith to the believer. So therefore, no matter what you do, you're righteous in God's sight. They have all kinds of illustrations that they like to use in this, in this realm to show you that how God is going to not look upon your heart, he just sees Jesus now. He doesn't see your vileness and your chiefest sinners and your wretched, wretched condition that you're going to eventually be delivered from, they keep saying, and all the stuff that they write, but of course it never happens because you're born in sin, you're saved in sin, and you sin every day in thought, word, and deed. So they, they contradict themselves. So you're saved then by trusting in the arrangement that God has made on that cross and receiving Jesus into your heart. Never by repentance and faith proven by deeds. Deeds are taboo. Anything that has to do with a faith that worketh by love and purifies the heart of sin is considered works. And that is her heresy to the modern day, modern day professed uh, churchgoers and the people that preach, supposedly preach the gospel. So they tell you that Jesus became sin on the cross and suffered God's wrath. He died for our sins. But yet again, you can't find that anywhere in Scripture. You can't find that in any of the illustrations, any of the parables that Jesus taught. We'll look at that in a minute. See, what this is is an entirely different vocabulary than the simple teachings of Christ that he came to deliver. He never once mentioned any of these classical doctrines that you people hold so dear in the professed church. Never once. 
He spoke of grace, meaning that it was freely given in order to change and transform man into a godly walk in this present age, like Titus 2.11 through 14 says, Grace of God's appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and live sober, righteously, godly in this present age. Looking for the glorious appearing of the Christ that he, he purified his church. How did he purify his church? By delivering them from sin through, through his sin sacrifice. When Jesus said, go and sin no more, that was the crux of the entire message that he gave. See, it was always judgment according to deeds done in the body. We see that all throughout Scripture, but yet we'll never see that mentioned by any of these people today that says not a works and nobody's perfect and all that. But yet throughout Scripture, that's the language, the language of obedience and diligence, holding fast, keeping his commandments, taking up your cross, Jesus didn't present himself as a substitution or something vicarious in your place. No, he, nor did he ever imply that man was born guilty of Adam's sin and lacking the ability to obey God. He assumed that everything was assumed that man had the natural ability, God-given free will ability to obey God from his heart. In fact, it even says in the scriptures and Proverbs 16, the preparation of the heart belongs to man. Not to God, to man. To come before him in repentance and faith. And not a single one of his parables or his teachings is supportive of any of these common doctrines that people hold so dear in the churches. Yet, almost everybody believes that stuff. Some of them even boil it down into moral government instead of penal substitution. And it all boils down to almost the same thing. If Jesus was your substitute, then how can he be your example at the same time? Just like I say, if you limit man's ability and free will, well then, how can he act? How can he obey God from his heart? See, you can't have it both ways. You can't have man born a sinner or born under a corrupt nature or any of those things or inherited anything from Adam and still have the ability to obey God. That's why they had to create all this nonsense about provenient grace and universal grace and all this other stuff added to the vocabulary. Like I say, where does the Bible teach that? Where does the Bible say uh, provenient grace to offset man's inability to obey God? Or universal or common grace? Where, where does it use that kind of terminology? Nowhere. Nowhere. You can't find the word Trinity in the Bible. Nor can you find where Christ's righteousness is imputed to you by faith. You can see faith is imputed to you as righteousness. You see that in the scriptures, but you don't see anywhere that Christ is imputed to you as righteousness. Search the scriptures for yourself and see. It just does not exist in the pages of scripture. In fact, the, the statement faith alone that they hold so dear that everybody's saved by faith alone. They put it in their creeds and their what we believe. You look on their web pages. It's the exact opposite of what Scripture says. In James 2.24, he says, You see, a man is justified by his deeds and not by faith alone. What are you going to do, throw that one out? Well, that's what Luther did. He called it the epistle of straw, that heretic. But what are you going to do with that? Read it for yourself. So to imply that a person can be saved by the faith of Abraham, in Romans 4, 3, Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness, without the deeds, without doing the deeds of Abraham, it says in Romans 4, 12, John 8, 39, if you were Abraham's sons, you would do the deeds of Abraham, Jesus told the Pharisees. You're in direct opposition with the teachings of Christ. Direct whether out of fear, whether it's intentionally that you leave those things out, that faith worketh by love, that it purifies the heart, that faith upholds the law, it establishes the law, but yet you chuck the law out the window. You chuck the moral law out the window, so there's no moral code basis of faith whatsoever other than an intellectual faith alone grasping of receiving some nebulous thing about Christ that doesn't change you at all. 
Oh, you're told that there's going to be some magic change come over you uh, because he will empower you, but it never happens. Hence why we got all these classes and all the, the divorce class and the pornography class and the, and the, the alcoholics class because you never get delivered from your sin. You never get clear or pure and become an obedient saint because it's just simply not necessary. The thing is, is that the origin of each one of these invented concepts, as we went over painstakingly in our videos, that's keeping people in bondage to sin can be traced to a particular individual in history who introduced them long after the apostles completed their ministry in the first century AD. Long, long after. Sometimes thousands of years. You can research for yourself and you can see. If you just pick up your cross and research this stuff. The reason most professed Christians think they're born sinners and saved in sin and can never stop sinning is their blind allegiance to these fallacies. That's the simple, simplest reason. They're blindly allegiant to these fallacies and they won't check them out in the scriptures. They simply refuse to examine the facts as Christ said in, uh, in John uh, 5.39, you search the scriptures for in them you think that you have eternal life and they are which testify of me but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Well, you're not willing to obey his word at face value that you may have life. That's how simple this is. You just simply won't obey God and repent. Stop your sinning. Get clean before God and seek his face for the mercy of God. See, most people are going to follow these myths and these fables to the grave. Many have already. Believing wholly that they're safe in the arms of God and nothing can motivate people to dig deep into the solid foundation of Christ and depart from iniquity. They walk in the utter darkness of their delusion, oblivious to what's in store at the end. Like that Matthew scripture I read at the beginning about being workers of iniquity. The truth stares you directly in the face and you just shrug your shoulders with indifference and go on about your merry way having fun. That's what it's really all about, isn't it? Having, having all your parties and you know, your happy times. But that's not going to last forever. It seems sometimes that nothing can reach some of these people because why? They're workers of iniquity. And what happens with sin? Sin hardens the heart. The bitter root of sin springing up hardens and defiles many. You're told that it humbles you to admit that, oh, I'm just a poor, rotten sinner. The scriptures refer to the people of God as saints all through the scriptures, not sinners. They're not the Romans' wretch. They're not the chief of sinners. Those were in former times. Former times. It wasn't just till recently that they became part of the creeds of the modern-day church that everybody thinks, if I say I have no sin, I deceive myself and the truth is not in me. Are you sure that's what 1 John 1, 8 means? When he says he who sins is of the devil very quickly after that, you better examine the facts because your soul is at stake.